Section 16 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Miraculous Pitcher, Part 1. One evening, in times long ago, old Philemon and his old wife, Bossus, sat at their cottage door, enjoying the calm and beautiful sunset. They had already eaten their frugal supper, and intended now to spend a quiet hour or two before bedtime. So they talked together about their garden, and their cow, and their bees, and their grapevine, which clambered over the cottage wall, and on which the grapes were beginning to turn purple. But the rude shouts of children and the fierce barking of dogs in the village near at hand grew louder and louder, until at last it was hardly possible for Bossus and Philemon to hear each other speak. "'Ah, wife!' cried Philemon. "'I fear some poor travellers seeking hospitality among our neighbours yonder, and instead of giving him food and lodging they have set their dogs at him, as their custom is.' "'Well a day,' answered old Bossus. I do wish our neighbors felt a little more kindness for their fellow creatures, and only think of bringing up their children in this naughty way and patting them on the head when they fling stones at strangers. Those children will never come to any good, said Philemon, shaking his white head. To tell you the truth, wife, I should not wonder if some terrible thing were to happen to all the people in the village unless they mend their manners. But as for you and me, so long as Providence affords us a crust of bread, let us be ready to give half to any poor homeless stranger that may come along and need it. That's right, husband, said Bossus, so we will. These old folks, you must know, were quite poor, and had to work pretty hard for a living. Old Philemon toiled diligently in his garden, while Bossus was always busy with her distaff, or making a little butter and cheese with her cow's milk, or doing one thing and another about the cottage. Their food was seldom anything but bread, milk, and vegetables, with sometimes a portion of honey from their beehive, and now and then a bunch of grapes that had ripened against the cottage wall. But they were two of the kindest old people in the world, and would cheerfully have gone without their dinners any day, rather than refuse a slice of their brown loaf, a cup of new milk, and a spoonful of honey to the weary traveler who might pause before their door. They felt as if such guests had a sort of holiness, and that they ought, therefore, to treat them better and more bountifully than their own selves. Their cottage stood on a rising ground, at some short distance from a village, which lay in a hollow valley, and was about half a mile in breadth. This valley, in past ages, when the world was new, had probably been a bed of a lake. There, fishes had glided to and fro in the depths, and water weeds had grown along the margin, and trees and hills had seen their reflected images in the broad and peaceful mirror. But, as the water subsided, men had cultivated the soil, and built houses on it, so that it was now a fertile spot, and bore no traces of the ancient lake, except a very small brook, which meandered through the mist of the village, and supplied the inhabitants with water. The valley had been dry land so long that oaks had sprung up, and grown great and high, and perished with old age, and had been succeeded by others as tall and stately as the first. Never was there a prettier or more fruitful valley. The very sight of the plenty around them should have made the inhabitants kind and gentle, and ready to show their gratitude to Providence by doing good to their fellow creatures. But, we are sorry to say, the people of this lovely village were not worthy to dwell in a spot on which heaven had smiled so beneficently. They were a very selfish and hard-hearted people, and had no pity for the poor, nor sympathy with the homeless. They would only have laughed had anybody told them that human beings owe a debt of love to one another, because there is no other method of paying the debt of love and care which all of us owe to Providence. You will hardly believe what I am going to tell you. These naughty people taught their children to be no better than themselves, and used to clap their hands, by way of encouragement, when they saw the little boys and girls run after some poor stranger, shouting his heels, and pelting him with stones. They kept large and fierce dogs, and whenever a traveller ventured to show himself in the village street, this pack of disagreeable curs scampered to meet him, barking, snarling, and showing their teeth. Then they would seize him by his leg, or by his clothes, just as it happened. And if he were ragged when he came, 
he was generally a pitiable object before he had time to run away. This was a very terrible thing to poor travelers, as you might suppose, especially when they chanced to be sick, or feeble, or lame, or old. Such persons, if they once knew how badly these unkind people and their unkind children and curs were in the habit of behaving, would go miles and miles out of their way, rather than try to pass through the village again. What made the matter seem worse, if possible, was that when rich persons came in their chariots, or riding on beautiful horses, with their servants in rich liveries attending on them, nobody could be more civil and obsequious than the inhabitants of the village. They would take off their hats and make the humblest bows you ever saw. If the children were rude, they were pretty certain to get their ears boxed. And as for the dogs, if a single cur in the pack presumed to yelp, his master instantly beat him with a club and tied him up without any supper. This would have been all very well, only it proved that the villagers cared much about the money that a stranger had in his pocket, and nothing whatever for the human soul, which lives equally in the beggar and the prince. So now you can understand why old Philemon spoke so sorrowfully when he heard the shouts of the children and the barking of the dogs at the farther extremity of the village street. There was a confused din, which lasted a good while, and seemed to pass quite through the breadth of the valley. "'I never heard the dogs so loud,' observed the good old man. "'Nor the children so rude,' answered his good wife. They sat shaking their heads, one to another, while the noise came nearer and nearer, until, at the foot of the little eminence on which their cottage stood, they saw two travellers approaching on foot. Close behind them came the fierce dogs, snarling at their very heels, a little farther off ran a crowd of children who sent up shrill cries and flung stones at the two strangers with all their might. Once or twice the younger of the two men, he was a slender and very active figure, turned about and drove back the dogs with a staff which he carried in his hand. His companion, who was a very tall person, walked calmly along as if disdaining to notice either the naughty children or the pack of curs whose manners the children seemed to imitate. Both of the travellers were very humbly clad, and looked as if they might not have money enough in their pockets to pay for a night's lodging. And this, I am afraid, was the reason why the villagers had allowed their children and dogs to treat them so rudely. "'Come, wife,' said Philemon to Bossus, "'let us go and meet these poor people. No doubt they feel almost too heavy-hearted to climb the hill.' "'Go you and meet them,' answered Bossus while I make haste within doors, and see whether we can get them anything for supper. A comfortable bowl of bread and milk would do wonders towards raising their spirits. Accordingly, she hastened into the cottage. Philemon, on his part, went forward, and extended his hand with so hospitable an aspect that there was no need of saying what nevertheless he did say, in the heartiest tone imaginable. Welcome, strangers, welcome! Thank you, replied the younger of the two in a lively kind of way, notwithstanding his weariness and trouble. This is quite another greeting than we have met with yonder in the village. Pray, why do you live in such a bad neighborhood? Ah, observed old Philemon, with a quiet and benign smile, Providence put me here. I hope, among other reasons, in order that I may make you what amends I can for the inhospitality of my neighbors. Well said, old father, cried the traveller, laughing. And, if the truth must be told, my companion and myself need some amends. Those children, the little rascals, have bespattered us finely with their mud balls, and one of the curs has torn my cloak, which was ragged enough already. But I took him across the muzzle with my staff, and I think you might have heard him yelp, even thus far off. Philemon was glad to see him in such good spirits, nor, indeed, would you have fancied, by the traveller's look and manner, that he was weary with the long day's journey besides being disheartened by the rough treatment at the end of it. He was dressed in rather an odd way, with a sort of cap on his head, the brim of which stuck out over both ears. Though it was a summer evening, he wore a cloak, which he kept wrapped closely about him, perhaps because his undergarments were shabby. Philemon perceived, too, that he had on a singular pair of shoes, but, as it was now growing dusk, and as the old man's eyesight was none the sharpest, he could not precisely tell in what the strangeness consisted. 
one thing certainly seemed queer. The traveler was so wonderfully light and active that it appeared as if his feet sometimes rose from the ground of their own accord, or could only be kept down by an effort. "'I used to be light-footed in my youth,' said Philemon to the traveler, "'but I always found my feet grow heavier toward nightfall.' "'There is nothing like a good staff to help one along,' answered the traveler, "'and I happen to have an excellent one, as you see.' This staff, in fact, was the oddest-looking staff that Philemon had ever beheld. It was made of olive wood, and had something like a little pair of wings near the top. Two snakes, carved in the wood, were represented as twining themselves about the staff, and were so very skillfully executed that old Philemon, whose eyes, you know, were getting rather dim, almost thought them alive, and that he could see them wriggling and twisting. A curious piece of work, sure enough, said he, a staff with wings. It would be an excellent kind of stick for a little boy to ride astride of. By this time Philemon and his two guests had reached the cottage door. Friends, said the old man, sit down and rest yourselves here on this bench. My good wife, Bossus, has gone to see what you can have for supper. We are poor folks, but you shall be welcome to whatever we have in the cupboard. The younger stranger threw himself carelessly on the bench, letting his staff fall as he did so. And here happened something rather marvelous, though trifling enough, too. The staff seemed to get up from the ground of its own accord, and, spreading its little pair of wings, it half hopped, half flew, and leaned itself against the wall of the cottage. There it stood quite still, except that the snakes continued to wriggle. But, in my private opinion, old Philemon's eyesight had been playing him tricks again. Before he could ask any questions, the elder stranger drew his attention from the wonderful staff by speaking to him. "'Was there not,' asked the stranger in a remarkably deep tone of voice, "'a lake in very ancient times covering the spot where now stands yonder village?' "'Not in my day, friend,' answered Philemon. "'And yet I am an old man, as you see.' There were always the fields and meadows, just as they are now, and the old trees, and the little stream murmuring through the mist of the valley. My father, nor his father before him, ever saw it otherwise, so far as I know, and doubtless it will still be the same when old Philemon shall be gone and forgotten. "'That is more than can be safely foretold,' observed the stranger, and there was something very stern in his deep voice. He shook his head, too, so that his dark and heavy curls were shaken with the movement. Since the inhabitants of yonder village have forgotten the affections and sympathies of their nature, it were better that the lake should be rippling over their dwellings again. The traveller looked so stern that Philemon was really almost frightened, the more so that, at his frown, the twilight seemed suddenly to grow darker, and that, when he shook his head, there was a roll as of thunder in the air. But in a moment afterwards, the stranger's face became so kindly and mild that the old man quite forgot his terror. Nevertheless, he could not help feeling that this elder traveller must be no ordinary personage, although he happened now to be attired so humbly and to be journeying on foot. Not that Philemon fancied himself a prince in disguise, or any character of that sort, but rather some exceedingly wise man who went about the world in this poor garb, despising wealth and all worldly objects, and seeking everywhere to add a mite to his wisdom. This idea appeared the more probable, because when Philemon raised his eyes to the stranger's face, he seemed to see more thought there in one look than he could have studied out in a lifetime. While Bossus was getting the supper, the travellers both began to talk very sociably with Philemon, the younger, indeed, was extremely loquacious, and made such shrewd and witty remarks that the good old man continually burst out a-laughing, and pronounced him the merriest fellow whom he had seen for many a day. "'Pray, my young friend,' said he, as they grew familiar together, "'what may I call your name?' "'Why, I am very nimble, as you see,' answered the traveller. "'So, if you call me Quicksilver, the name will fit tolerably well.' "'Quicksilver? Quicksilver?' repeated Philemon, looking in the traveller's face, to see if he were making fun of him. It is a very odd name. And your companion there, has he as strange a one? You must ask the thunder to tell it you, replied Quicksilver, putting on a mysterious look. 
no other voice is loud enough. This remark, whether it were serious or in jest, might have caused Philemon to conceive a very great awe of the elder stranger, if, on venturing to gaze at him, he had not beheld so much beneficence in his visage. But, undoubtedly, here was the grandest figure that ever sat so humbly beside a cottage door. When the stranger conversed, it was with gravity, and in such a way that Philemon felt irresistibly moved to tell him everything which he had most at heart. This is always the feeling that people have, when they meet with any one wise enough to comprehend all their good and evil, and to despise not a tittle of it. But Philemon, simple and kind-hearted old man that he was, had not many secrets to disclose. He talked, however, quite garrulously, about the events of his past life, in the whole course of which he had never been a score of miles from this very spot. His wife, Bossus, and himself had dwelt in the cottage from their youth upward, earning their bread by honest labor, always poor, but still contented. He told what excellent butter and cheese Bossus made, and how nice were the vegetables which he raised in his garden. He said, too, that, because they loved one another so very much, it was the wish of both that death might not separate them, but that they should die, as they had lived, together. As the stranger listened, a smile beamed over his countenance, and made its expression as sweet as it was grand. "'You are a good old man,' said he to Philemon. "'And you have a good wife to be your helpmeet. It is fit that your wish be granted.' And it seemed to Philemon, just then, as if the sunset clouds threw up a bright flash from the west, and kindled a sudden light in the sky. End of section 16 Section 17 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne Chapter 17 The Miraculous Pitcher, Part 2 Baucus had now got supper ready, and coming to the door began to make apologies for the poor fare which he was forced to set before her guests. "'Had we known you were coming,' said she, "'my good man and myself would have gone without a morsel, rather than you should lack a better supper. But I took the most part of today's milk to make cheese, and our last loaf is already half eaten. Ah, oh, me!' I never feel the sorrow of being poor, save when a poor traveller knocks at our door. All will be very well. Do not trouble yourself, my good dame, replied the elder stranger kindly. An honest, hearty welcome to a guest works miracles with a fair, and is capable of turning the coarsest food to nectar and ambrosia. A welcome you shall have, cried Baucus, and likewise a little honey that we happen to have left and a bunch of purple grapes besides. "'Why, Mother Baucus, it is a feast!' exclaimed Quicksilver, laughing. "'An absolute feast, and you shall see how bravely I will play my part at it. I think I've never felt hungrier in my life.' "'Mercy on us!' whispered Baucus to her husband. "'If the young man has such a terrible appetite, I am afraid there will not be half enough supper.' They all went into the cottage. And now, my little auditors, shall I tell you something that will make you open your eyes very wide? It is really one of the oddest circumstances in the whole story. Quicksilver's staff, you recollect, had set itself up against the wall of the cottage. Well, when its master entered the door, leaving this wonderful staff behind, what should it do but immediately spread its little wings and go hopping and fluttering up the doorsteps? Tap tap went the staff on the kitchen floor nor did it rest until it had stood itself on end with the greatest gravity and decorum beside quicksilver's chair old philemon however as well as his wife was so taken up in attending to their guests that no notice was given to what the staff had been about as baucis had said 
there was but a scanty supper for two hungry travellers in the middle of the table was the remnant of a brown loaf with a piece of cheese on one side of it and a dish of honeycomb on the other there was a pretty good bunch of grapes for each of the guests a moderately sized earthen pitcher nearly full of milk stood at a corner of the board and when baucis had filled two bowls and set them before the strangers only a little milk remained in the bottom of the pitcher alas it is a very sad business when a bountiful heart finds itself pinched and squeezed among narrow circumstances poor baucis kept wishing that she might starve for a week to come if it were possible by so doing to provide these hungry folks a more plentiful supper and since the supper was so exceedingly small she could not help wishing that their appetites had not been quite so large why at their very first sitting down the travellers both drank off all the milk in their two bowls at a draught a little more milk kind mother baucis if you please said quicksilver the day has been hot and i am very much athirst now my dear people answered baucis in great confusion i'm so sorry and ashamed but the truth is there is hardly a drop more milk in the pitcher oh husband husband why didn't we go without our supper why it appears to me cried quicksilver starting up from the table and taking the pitcher by the handle it really appears to me that matters are not quite so bad as you represent them here is certainly more milk in the pitcher so saying and to the vast astonishment of baucis he proceeded to fill not only his own bowl but his companions likewise from the pitcher that was supposed to be almost empty the good woman could scarcely believe her eyes she had certainly poured out nearly all the milk and had peeped in afterwards and seen the bottom of the pitcher as she set it down upon the table but i am old thought baucis to herself and apt to be forgetful i suppose i must have made a mistake at all events the pitcher cannot help being empty now after filling the bowls twice over what excellent milk observed quicksilver after quaffing the contents of the second bowl excuse me my kind hostess but i must really ask you for a little more now baucis had seen as plainly as she could see anything that quicksilver had turned the pitcher upside down and consequently had poured out every drop of milk in filling the last bowl of course there could not possibly be any left however in order to let him know precisely how the case was she lifted the pitcher and made a gesture as if pouring milk into quicksilver's bowl but without the remotest idea that any milk would stream forth what was her surprise therefore when such an abundant cascade fell bubbling into the bowl that it was immediately filled to the brim and overflowed upon the table the two snakes that were twisted about quicksilver's staff but neither baucis nor philemon happened to observe this circumstance stretched out their heads and began to lap up the spilt milk and then what a delicious fragrance the milk had it seemed as if philemon's only cow must have pastured that day on the richest herbage that could be found anywhere in the world i only wish that each of you my beloved little souls could have a bowl of such nice milk at supper time and now a slice of your brown loaf mother baucis said quicksilver and a little of that honey baucis cut him a slice accordingly and though the loaf when she and her husband ate of it had been rather too dry and crusty to be palatable it was now as light and moist as if but a few hours out of the oven tasting a crumb which had fallen on the table she found it more delicious than bread ever was before and could hardly believe that it was a loaf of her own kneading and baking and yet what other loaf could it possibly be but oh the honey i may just as well let it alone without trying to describe how exquisitely it smelt and looked its colour was that of the purest and most transparent gold and it had the odour of a thousand flowers but of such flowers as never grew in an earthly garden 
and to seek which the bees must have flown high above the clouds the wonder is that after alighting on a flower-bed of so delicious fragrance and immortal bloom they should have been content to fly down again to their hive in philemon's garden never was such honey tasted seen or smelt the perfume floated around the kitchen and made it so delightful that had you closed your eyes you would instantly have forgotten the low ceiling and smoky walls and have fancied yourself in an arbor with celestial honeysuckles creeping over it although good mother baucis was a simple old dame she could not but think that there was something rather out of the common way in all that had been going on so after helping the guests to bread and honey and laying a bunch of grapes by each of their plates she sat down by philemon and told him what she had seen in a whisper did you ever hear the like asked she no i never did answered philemon with a smile and i rather think my dear old wife you've been walking about in a sort of dream if i had poured out the milk i should have seen through the business at once there happened to be a little more in the pitcher than you thought that is all ah husband said baucis say what you will these are very uncommon people well well replied philemon still smiling perhaps they are they certainly do look as if they had seen better days and i am heartily glad to see them making so comfortable a supper each of the guests had now taken his bunch of grapes upon his plate baucis who rubbed her eyes in order to see the more clearly was of opinion that the clusters had grown larger and richer and that each separate grape seemed to be on the point of bursting with ripe juice it was entirely a mystery to her how such grapes could have ever been produced from the old stunted vine that climbed against the cottage wall very admirable grapes these observed quicksilver as he swallowed one after another without apparently diminishing his cluster pray my good host whence did you gather them from my own vine answered philemon you may see one of its branches twisting across the window yonder but wife and i never thought the grapes very fine ones i never tasted better said the guest another cup of this delicious milk if you please and i shall then have supped better than a prince this time old philemon bestirred himself and took up the pitcher for he was curious to discover whether there was any reality in the marvels which baucis had whispered to him he knew that his good old wife was incapable of falsehood and that she was seldom mistaken in what she supposed to be true but this was so very singular a case that he wanted to see into it with his own eyes on taking up the pitcher therefore he slyly peeped into it and was fully satisfied that it contained not so much as a single drop all at once however he beheld a little white fountain which gushed up from the bottom of the pitcher and speedily filled it to the brim with foaming and deliciously fragrant milk it was lucky that philemon in his surprise did not drop the miraculous pitcher from his hand who are ye wonder-working strangers cried he even more bewildered than his wife had been your guests my good philemon and your friends replied the elder traveller in his mild deep voice that had something at once sweet and awe-inspiring in it give me likewise a cup of the milk and may your pitcher never be empty for kind baucis and yourself any more than for the needy wayfarer the supper being now over the strangers requested to be shown to their place of repose the old people would gladly have talked with them a little longer and have expressed the wonder which they felt and their delight at finding the poor and meagre supper prove so much better and more abundant than they hoped but the elder traveller had inspired them with such reverence that they dared not ask him any questions and when philemon drew quicksilver aside and inquired how under the sun a fountain of milk could have got into an old earthen pitcher 
this latter personage pointed to his staff there is the whole mystery of the affair quoth quicksilver and if you can make it out i'll thank you to let me know i can't tell what to make of my staff it's always playing such odd tricks as this sometimes getting me a supper and quite as often stealing it away if i had any faith in such nonsense i should say the stick was bewitched he said no more but looked so slyly in their faces that they rather fancied he was laughing at them the magic staff went hopping at his heels as quicksilver quitted the room when left alone the good old couple spent some little time in conversation about the events of the evening and then lay down on the floor and fell fast asleep they had given up their sleeping room to the guests and had no other bed for themselves save these planks which i wish had been as soft as their own hearts the old man and his wife were stirring betimes in the morning and the strangers likewise arose with the sun and made their preparations to depart philemon hospitably entreated them to remain a little longer until baucis could milk the cow and bake a cake upon the hearth and perhaps find them a few fresh eggs for breakfast the guests however seemed to think it better to accomplish a good part of their journey before the heat of the day should come on they therefore persisted in setting out immediately but asked philemon and baucis to walk forth with them a short distance and show them the road which they were to take so they all four issued from the cottage chatting together like old friends it was very remarkable indeed how familiar the old couple insensibly grew with the elder traveller and how their good and simple spirits melted into his even as two drops of water would melt into the illimitable ocean and as for quicksilver with his keen quick laughing wits he appeared to discover every little thought that but peeped into their minds before they suspected it themselves they sometimes wished it is true that he had not been quite so quick-witted and also that he would fling away his staff which looked so mysteriously mischievous with the snakes always writhing about it but then again quicksilver showed himself so very good-humoured that they would have been rejoiced to keep him in their cottage staff snakes and all every day and the whole day long ah me well a day exclaimed philemon when they had walked a little way from their door if our neighbours only knew what a blessed thing it is to show hospitality to strangers they would tie up all their dogs and never allow their children to fling another stone it is a sin and shame for them to behave so that it is cried good old baucis vehemently and i mean to go this very day and tell some of them what naughty people they are i fear remarked quicksilver slyly smiling that you will find none of them at home the elder traveller's brow just then assumed such a grave stern and awful grandeur yet serene withal that neither baucis nor philemon dared to speak a word they gazed reverently into his face as if they had been gazing at the sky when men do not feel towards the humblest stranger as if he were a brother said the traveller in tones so deep that they sounded like those of an organ they are unworthy to exist on earth which was created as the abode of a great human brotherhood and by the by my dear old people cried quicksilver with the liveliest look of fun and mischief in his eyes where is this same village that you talk about on which side of it does it lie methinks i do not see it hereabouts philemon and his wife turned toward the valley where at sunset only the day before they had seen the meadows the houses the gardens the clump of trees the wide green margin street with children playing in it and all the tokens of business enjoyment and prosperity but what was their astonishment there was no longer any appearance of a village even the fertile vale in the hollow of which it lay had ceased to have existence in its stead they beheld the broad blue surface of a lake which filled the great basin of the valley from brim to brim and reflected the surrounding hills in its bosom 
with as tranquil an image as if it had been there ever since the creation of the world for an instant the lake remained perfectly smooth then a little breeze sprang up and caused the water to dance glitter and sparkle in the early sunbeams and to dash with a pleasant rippling murmur against the hither shore the lake seemed so strangely familiar that the old couple were greatly perplexed and felt as if they could only have been dreaming about a village having lain there but the next moment they remembered the vanished dwellings and the faces and characters of the inhabitants far too distinctly for a dream the village had been there yesterday and now was gone alas cried these kind-hearted old people what has become of our poor neighbors they exist no longer as men and women said the elder traveller in his grand and deep voice while a roll of thunder seemed to echo it at a distance there was neither use nor beauty in such a life as theirs for they never softened or sweetened the hard lot of mortality by the exercise of kindly affections between man and man they retained no image of the better life in their bosoms therefore the lake that was of old has spread itself forth again to reflect the sky and as for these foolish people said quicksilver with his mischievous smile they are all transformed to fishes there needed but little change for they were already a scaly set of rascals and the coldest blooded beings in existence so kind mother baucis whenever you or your husband have an appetite for a dish of broiled trout he can throw in a line and pull out half a dozen of your old neighbors ah cried baucis shuddering i would not for the world put one of them on the gridiron no added philemon making a wry face we could never relish them as for you good philemon continued the elder traveller and you kind baucis you with your scanty means have mingled so much heartfelt hospitality with your entertainment of the homeless stranger that the milk became an inexhaustible fount of nectar and the brown loaf and the honey were ambrosia thus the divinities have feasted at your board off the same viands that supply their banquets on olympus you have done well my dear old friends wherefore request whatever favour you have most at heart and it is granted philemon and baucis looked at one another and then i know not which of the two it was who spoke but that one uttered the desire of both their hearts let us live together while we live and leave the world at the same instant when we die for we have always loved one another be it so replied the stranger with majestic kindness now look towards your cottage they did so but what was their surprise on beholding a tall edifice of white marble with a wide open portal occupying the spot where their humble residence had so lately stood there is your home said the stranger beneficently smiling on them both exercise your hospitality in yonder palace as freely as in the poor hovel to which you welcomed us last evening the old folks fell on their knees to thank him but behold neither he nor quicksilver was there so philemon and baucis took up their residence in the marble palace and spent their time with vast satisfaction to themselves in making everybody jolly and comfortable who happened to pass their way the milk pitcher i must not forget to say retained its marvellous quality of being never empty when it was desirable to have it full whenever an honest good-humoured and free-hearted guest took a draught from this pitcher he invariably found it the sweetest and most invigorating fluid that ever ran down his throat but if a cross and disagreeable curmudgeon happened to sip he was pretty certain to twist his visage into a hard knot and pronounce it a pitcher of sour milk and thus the old couple lived in their palace a great great while and grew older and older and very old indeed <laughs> 
at length however there came a summer morning when philemon and baucis failed to make their appearance as on other mornings with one hospitable smile overspreading both their pleasant faces to invite the guests of overnight to breakfast the guests searched everywhere from top to bottom of the spacious palace and all to no purpose but after a great deal of perplexity they espied in front of the portal two venerable trees which nobody could remember to have seen there the day before and yet there they stood with their roots fastened deep in the soil and a huge breadth of foliage overshadowing the whole front of the edifice one was an oak and the other a linden tree their boughs it was strange and beautiful to see were intertwined together and embraced one another so that each tree seemed to live in the other tree's bosom much more than in its own while the guests were marvelling how these trees that must have required at least a century to grow could have come to be so tall and venerable in a single night a breeze sprang up and set their intermingled boughs astir then there was a deep broad murmur in the air as if the two mysterious trees were speaking i am old philemon murmured the oak i am old baucis murmured the linden tree but as the breeze grew stronger the trees both spoke at once philemon baucis baucis philemon as if one were both and both were one and talking together in the depths of their mutual heart it was plain enough to perceive that the good old couple had renewed their age and were now to spend a quiet and delightful hundred years or so philemon as an oak and baucis as a linden tree and oh what a hospitable shade did they fling around them whenever a wayfarer paused beneath it he heard a pleasant whisper of the leaves above his head and wondered how the sound should so much resemble words like these welcome welcome dear traveller welcome and some kind soul that knew what would have pleased old baucis and old philemon best built a circular seat around both their trunks where for a great while afterwards the weary and the hungry and the thirsty used to repose themselves and quaff milk abundantly out of the miraculous pitcher and i wish for all our sakes that we had the pitcher here now end of section seventeen section eighteen of a wonder book for girls and boys this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. After the story of the miraculous picture. How much did the picture hold? asked Sweet Fern. It did not hold quite a quart, answered the student but you might keep pouring milk out of it until you should fill a hogshead if you pleased the truth is it would run on forever and not be dry even at midsummer which is more than can be said of yonder rill that goes babbling down the hillside and what has become of the pitcher now inquired the little boy it was broken i am sorry to say about twenty-five thousand years ago replied cousin eustace the people mended it as well as they could but though it would hold milk pretty well it was never afterward known to fill itself of its own accord so you see it was no better than any other cracked earthen pitcher what a pity cried all the children at once the respectable dog ben had accompanied the party as likewise did a half-grown newfoundland puppy who went by the name of Bruin, because he was just as black as a bear. Ben, being elderly and of very circumspect habits, was respectfully requested by Cousin Eustace to stay behind with the four little children, in order to keep them out of mischief. As for Black Bruin, who was himself nothing but a child, 
the student thought it best to take him along lest in his rude play with the other children he should trip them up and send them rolling and tumbling down the hill advising cowslip sweet fern dandelion and squash blossom to sit pretty still in the spot where he left them the student with primrose and the elder children began to ascend and were soon out of sight among the trees end of section eighteen section nineteen of the wonder book for girls and boys this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a wonder book for girls and boys by nathaniel hawthorne introductory to the chimera upward along the steep and wooded hillside went eustace bright and his companions the trees were not yet in full leaf but had budded forth sufficiently to throw an airy shadow while the sunshine filled them with green light there were moss grown rocks half hidden among the old brown fallen leaves there were rotten tree trunks lying at full length where they had long ago fallen there was decaying boughs that had been shaken down by the wintry gales and were scattered everywhere about but still though these things looked so aged the aspect of the wood was that of the newest life for whichever way you turned your eyes something fresh and green was springing forth so as to be ready for the summer at last the young people reached the upper verge of the wood and found themselves almost at the summit of the hill it was not a peak nor a great round ball but a pretty wide plain or tableland with a house and a barn upon it at some distance the house was the home of a solitary family and oftentimes the clouds whence fell the rain and whence the snowstorm drifted down into the valley hung lower than this bleak and lonely dwelling-place on the highest part of the hill was a heap of stones in the centre of which was stuck a long pole with a little flag fluttering at the end of it eustace led the children thither and bade them look around and see how large a tract of our beautiful world they could take in at a glance and their eyes grew wider as they looked monument mountain to the southward was still in the centre of the scene but seemed to have sunk and subsided so that it was now but an undistinguished member of a large family of hills beyond it the taconic range looked higher and bulkier than before our pretty lake was seen with all its little bays and inlets and not that alone but two or three new lakes were opening their blue eyes to the sun several white villages each with its steeple were scattered about in the distance there were so many farmhouses with their acres of woodland pasture mowing fields and tillage that the children could scarcely make room in their minds to receive all these different objects there too was tanglewood which they had hitherto thought such an important apex of the world it now occupied so small a space that they gazed far beyond it and on either side and searched a good while with all their eyes before discovering whereabout it stood white fleecy clouds were hanging in the air and threw the dark spots of their shadow here and there over the landscape but by and by the sunshine was where the shadow had been and the shadow was somewhere else far to the southward was a range of blue mountains which eustace bright told the children were the catskills among those misty hills he said was a spot where some old dutchmen were playing an everlasting game of ninepins and where an idle fellow whose name was rip van winkle had fallen asleep and slept twenty years at a stretch the children eagerly besought eustace to tell them all about this wonderful affair but the student replied that the story had once been told already and better than it ever could be told again and that nobody 
would have a right to alter a word of it, until it should have grown as old as the Gorgon's head and the three golden apples, and the rest of those miraculous legends. At least, said Periwinkle, while we rest ourselves here and are looking about us, you can tell us another of your own stories. Yes, cousin Eustace, cried Primrose, I advise you to tell us a story here. Take some lofty subject or other, and see if your imagination will not come up to it. Perhaps the mountain air may make you poetical for once, and no matter how strange and wonderful the story may be, now that we are up amongst the clouds, we can believe anything. Can you believe, asked Eustace, that there once was a winged horse? Yes, said Saucy Primrose, but I am afraid you will never be able to catch him. For that matter, Primrose, rejoined the student, I might possibly catch Pegasus, and get upon his back, too, as well as a dozen other fellows that I know of. At any rate, here is a story about him, and, of all places in the world, it ought certainly to be told upon a mountain top. So, sitting on the pile of stones, while the children clustered themselves at its base, Eustace fixed his eyes on a white cloud that was sailing by, and began as follows. End of section 19section 20 of a wonder book for girls and boys this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruby gleber of atlanta georgia a wonder book for girls and boys by nathaniel hawthorne the chimera part 1 once in the old old times for all the strange things which I tell you about happened long before anybody can remember, a fountain gushed out of a hillside in the marvelous land of Greece. And, for aught I know, after so many thousand years, it is still gushing out of the very self-same spot. At any rate, there is the pleasant fountain, welling freshly forth and sparkling adown the hillside in the golden sunset, when a handsome young man named Bellifrofen drew near its margin. In his hand he held a bridle, studded with brilliant gems and adorned with a golden bit. Seeing an old man and another of middle-aged and a little boy near the fountain, and likewise a maiden who was dipping up some of the water in a pitcher, he paused and begged that he might refresh himself with a drought. This is a very delicious water, he said to the maiden, as he rinsed and filled her pitcher after drinking out of it. Will you be kind enough to tell me whether the fountain has any name? Yes, it is called the Fountain of Pyrene, answered the maiden, and then she added, My grandfather has told me that this clear fountain was once a beautiful woman, and when her son was killed by the arrows of the huntress Diana, she melted all away into tears. And so the water, which you find so cool and sweet, is the sorrow of that poor woman's heart. I should not have dreamed, observed the young stranger, that so clear a wellspring with its gush and gurgle, and its cheery dance out of the shade into the sunlight, had so much as one teardrop in its bosom. And this, then, is Pyrene? I thank you, pretty maiden, for telling me its name. I have come up from a faraway country to find this very spot. A middle-aged country fellow, he had driven his cow to drink out of the spring, stared hard at young Bellifrofen, and at the handsome bridle which he carried in his hand. The water courses must be getting low, friend, in your part of the world, remarked he, if you come so far only to find the fountain of Pyrene. But pray, have you lost a horse? I see you carry the bridle in your hand, and a very pretty one it is, with the double row of bright stones upon it. If the horse was as fine as the bridle, you are much to be pitied for losing him. I have lost no horse, said Bellerophon, with a smile, but I happen to be seeking a very famous one, which, as wise people have informed me, must be found hereabouts, if anywhere. Do you know whether the winged horse Pegasus still haunts the fountain of Pyrene, as he used to do in your forefathers' days? But then the country fellow laughed. Some of you, my little friends, have probably heard that this Pegasus was a snow-white steed with beautiful silvery wings who spent most of this time on the summit of Mount Helicon. 
He was as wild and as swift and as buoyant in his flight through the air as any eagle that ever soared into the clouds. There was nothing else like him in the world. He had no mate. He had never been backed or bridled by a master, and for many a long year he led a solitary and a happy life. Oh, how fine a thing it is to be a winged horse, sleeping at night as he did on a lofty mountain top and passing the greater part of the day in the air. Pegasus seemed hardly to be a creature of the earth. Whenever he was seen up very high above people's heads, with the sunshine on his silvery wings, you would have thought that he belonged to the sky, and that skimming a little too low, he had got astray among our midst and vapors, and was seeking his way back again. It was very pretty to behold him plunge into the fleecy bosom of a bright cloud, and he lost in it for a moment or two, and then break forth from the other side. Or, in a sullen rainstorm, when there was a gray pavement of clouds over the whole sky, it would sometimes happen that the winged horse descended right through it, and the glad light of the upper region would gleam after him. In another instant, it is true, both Pegasus and the pleasant light would be gone away together, but any one that was fortunate enough to see this wonder spectacle felt cheerful the whole day afterwards, and as much longer as the storm lasted. In the summer time, and in a beautiful list of weather, Pegasus often alighted on the solid earth, and closing his silvery wings would gallop over hill and dale for pastime, as fleetly as the wind. Oftener than in any other place, he had been seen near the fountain of Pyrene, drinking the delicious water or rolling himself upon the soft grass of the margin. Sometimes, too, but Pegasus was very dainty in his food, he would crop a few of the clover blossoms that happened to be sweetest. In the fountain of Pyrene, therefore, people's great-grandfathers had been in the habit of going, as long as they were youthful and retained their faith in winged horses, in hopes of getting a glimpse at the beautiful Pegasus. But of late years he had been very seldom seen. Indeed, there were many of the country folks, dwelling within half an hour's walk of the fountain, who had never beheld Pegasus, and did not believe that there was any such creature in existence. The country fellow to whom Bellerophon was speaking chanced to be one of those incredulous persons. And that was the reason why he laughed. Pegasus, indeed, cried he, turning up his nose as high as such a flat nose could be turned up. Pegasus, indeed, a winged horse, truly. Why, friend, are you in your senses? Of what use would wings be to a horse? Could he drag the plow so well, think you? To be sure, there might be a little saving in the expense of shoes, but then how would a man like to see his horse flying out of the stable window? Yes, or whisking up him above the clouds when he only wanted to ride to mill. No, no, I don't believe in Pegasus. There never was such a ridiculous kind of a horse-fowl maid. I have some reason to think otherwise, said Bellerophon quietly. And then he turned to an old gray man who was leaning on a staff and listening very attentively with his head stretched forward and one hand at his ear, because for the last twenty years he'd been getting rather deaf. "'And what say you, venerable sir?' inquired he. "'In your younger days, I should imagine, you must frequently have seen the winged steed.' "'Ah, young stranger, my memory is very poor,' said the aged man. "'When I was a lad, if I remember rightly, I used to believe there was such a horse, and so did everybody else. But nowadays—' I hardly know it to think, and very seldom think about the winged horse at all. If I ever saw the creature, it was a long, long while ago, and to tell you the truth, I doubt whether I ever did see him. One day, to be sure, when I was quite a youth, I remember seeing some hoof tramps round about the brink of the fountain. Pegasus might have made those hoof marks, and so might some other horse. And have you never seen him, my fair maiden? asked Bellerophon to the girl, who stood with the pitcher on her head while the talk went on. You certainly should have seen Pegasus, if anybody can, for your eyes are very bright. Once I thought I saw him, replied the maiden, with a smile and a blush. It was either Pegasus or a large white bird, a very great way up in the air. And on another time, as I was coming to the fountain with my pitcher, I heard a neigh. Oh, such a brisk and melodious neigh what that was! My very heart leaped with delight at the sound. But it startled me nevertheless, so that I ran home without filling my pitcher. That was truly a pity, said Bellerophon, as he turned to the child, whom I mentioned at the beginning of the story, and who was gazing at him, as children are apt to gaze at strangers, with his rosy mouth wide open. Well, my little fellow, cried Bellerophon, 
playfully pulling out of his curls. I suppose you have often seen the winged horse. That I have, answered the child very readily. I saw him yesterday and many times before. You are a fine little man, said Bellerophon, drawing the child closer to him. Come, tell me all about it. Why, replied the child, I often come here to sail little boats in the fountain and to gather pretty pebbles out of its basin. And sometimes, when I look down into the water, I see the image of the winged horse in the picture of the sky that is there. I wish he would come down and take me on his back and let me ride him up to the moon. But if I so much as stir and look at him, he flies far out of sight. And Bellerophon put his faith in the child, who had seen the image of Pegasus in the water, and in the maiden, who had heard him neigh so melodiously, rather than in the middle-aged clown, who believed only in cart-horses, or in the old man who had forgotten the beautiful things of his youth. Therefore, he haunted about the fountain of Pyrene for a great many days afterwards. He kept continually on the watch, looking upward at the sky or else down into the water, hoping forever that he would see either the reflected image of the winged horse or the marvelous reality. He held the bridle with its bright gems and golden bit always ready in his hand. The rustic people who dwelt in the neighborhood and drove their cattle to the fountain to drink would often laugh at poor Bellerophon and sometimes take him pretty severely to ask. They told him that an able-bodied young man like himself ought to have better business than to be wasting his time in such an idle pursuit. They offered to sell him a horse if he wanted one, and when Bellerophon declined the purchase, they tried to drive a bargain with him for his fine bridle. Even the country boys thought him so very foolish that they used to have a great deal of sport about him, and were rude enough not to care a fig, although Bellerophon saw and heard it. One little urchin, for example, would play Pegasus, and cut the oddest imaginable capers by way of flying, while one of his schoolfellows would scamper after him, holding forth a twist of bulrushes, which was intended to represent Bellerophon's ornamental bridle. But the gentle child, who had seen the picture of Pegasus in the water, comforted the young stranger more than all the naughty boys could torment him. The dear little fellow, in his play hours, often sat down beside him, and without speaking a word, would look down into the fountain and up towards the sky, and so innocent of faith that Bellerophon could not help feeling encouraged. Now you will, perhaps, wish to be told why it was that Bellerophon had undertaken to catch the winged horse, and we shall find no better opportunity to speak about this matter than while he is waiting for Pegasus to appear. If I were to relate the whole of Bellerophon's previous adventures, they might easily grow into a very long story. It will be quite enough to say that in a certain country of Asia, a terrible monster called the Chimera had made its appearance, and was doing more mischief than could be talked about between now and sunset. According to the best accounts which I have been able to obtain, this Chimera was nearly, if not quite, the ugliest and most poisonous creature and the strangest and unaccountablest and the hardest to fight with, and the most difficult to run away from that ever came out of the earth's inside. It had a tail like a boa constrictor, its body was like I do not care what, and it had three separate heads, one of which was a lion's, the second a goat, and the third an abominably great snake's. And a hot blast of fire came flaming out of each of its three mouths. Being an earthly monster, I doubt whether it had any wings." But wings or so, it ran like a goat and a lion, and wriggled along like a serpent, and thus contrived to make about as much speed as all the three together. Oh, the mischief, and mischief, and mischief that this naughty creature did! With its flaming breath, it could set a forest on fire, or burn up a field of grain, or, for that matter, a village, with all its fences and houses. It laid waste the whole country roamed about, and used to eat up people and animals alive, and cooked them afterwards in the burning oven of its stomach. Mercy on us, little children. I hope neither you nor I will ever happen to meet a chimera. While the hateful beast, if a beast we can anywise call it, was doing all those horrible things, it so chanced that Bellerophon came to that part of the world on a visit to the king. The king's name was Iobates, and Lycia was the county which he ruled over. Bellerophon was one of the bravest youths in the world, and desired nothing so much as to do much valiant and beneficent deeds, such as would make all mankind admire and love him. In those days, the only way for a young man to distinguish himself was by fighting battles, 
either with the enemies of his country or with wicked giants or with troublesome dragons or with wild beasts when he could find nothing more dangerous to encounter king iobates perceiving the courage of this youthful visitor proposed to him to go and fight the chimera which everybody else was afraid of and which unless it should be soon killed was likely to convert lycia into a desert bellerophon hesitated not a moment but assured the king that he would either slay this dreaded chimera or perish in the attempt but in the first place as the monster was so prodigiously swift he thought himself that he should never win the victory by fighting on foot the wisest thing he could do therefore was to get the very best and fleetest horse that could anywhere be found and what other horse in all the world was half so fleet as the marvellous horse pegasus who had wings as well as legs and was even more active in the air than on the earth to be sure a great many people denied that there was any such horse with wings and said that the stories about him were all poetry and nonsense but wonderful as it appeared bellerophon believed that pegasus was a real steed and hoped that he himself might be fortunate enough to find him and once fairly mounted on his back he would be able to fight the chimera at better advantage all this was the purpose with which he had travelled from lycia to greece and had brought the beautifully ornamented bridle in his hand it was an enchanted bridle if he could only succeed in putting the golden bit into the mouth of pegasus the winged horse would be submissive and would own bellerophon for his master and fly whithsoever he might choose to turn therein but indeed it was a weary and anxious time while bellerophon waited and waited for pegasus in hopes that he could come and drink at the fountain of pyrene he was afraid lest king eubates would imagine that he had fled from the chimera it pained him too to think how much mischief the monster was doing while he himself instead of fighting with it was compelled to sit idly poring over the bright waters of pyrene as they gushed out of the sparkling sand and as pegasus came thither so seldom in these later days and scarcely alighted there more than once in a lifetime bellerophon feared that he might grow an old man and have no strength left in his arms nor courage in his heart before the winged horse would appear oh how heavily passes the time while an adventurous youth is yearning to do his part in life and to gather in the harvest of his renown how hard a lesson is it to wait our life is brief and how much of it is spent in teaching us only this end of section 20 recorded by ruby gleber from atlanta georgia section 21 of a wonder book for girls and boys this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by warren cotty gurney illinois a wonder book for girls and boys by nathaniel hawthorne section 21 the chimera part 2 well was it for bellerophon that the gentle child had grown so fond of him and was never weary of keeping him company every morning the child gave him a new hope to put in his bosom instead of yesterday's withered one dear bellerophon he would cry looking up hopefully into his face i think we shall see pegasus to-day and at length if it had not been for the little boy's unwavering faith bellerophon would have given up all hope and would have gone back to lycia and have done his best to slay the chimera without the help of the winged horse and in that case poor bellerophon would at least have been terribly scorched by the creature's breath and would most probably have been killed and devoured nobody should ever try to fight an earth-born chimera unless he can first get upon the back of an aerial steed one morning the child spoke to bellerophon even more hopefully than usual dear dear bellerophon he cried i know not why it is but i feel as if we should certainly see pegasus to-day and all that day he would not stir a step from bellerophon's side so they ate a crust of bread together and drank some of the water of the fountain in the afternoon there they sat and bellerophon had thrown his arm around the child who likewise had put one of his little hands into bellerophon's the latter was lost in his own thoughts and was fixing his eyes vacantly on the trunks of the trees that overshadowed the fountain and on the grapevines that clambered up among their branches 
but the gentle child was gazing down into the water he was grieved for bellerophon's sake that the hope of another day should be deceived like so many before it and two or three quiet teardrops fell from his eyes and mingled with what were said to be the many tears of pyrene when she wept for her slain children but when he least thought of it bellerophon felt the pressure of the child's little hand and heard a soft almost breathless whisper see there dear bellerophon there is an image in the water the young man looked down into the dimpling mirror of the fountain and saw what he took to be the reflection of a bird which seemed to be flying at a great height in the air with a gleam of sunshine on its snowy or silvery wings what a splendid bird it must be said he and how very large it looks though it must really be flying higher than the clouds it makes me tremble whispered the child i am afraid to look up into the air it is very beautiful and yet i dare only look at its image in the water dear bellerophon do you not see that it is no bird it is the winged horse pegasus bellerophon's heart began to throb he gazed keenly upward but could not see the winged creature whether bird or horse because just then it had plunged into the fleecy depths of a summer cloud it was but a moment however before the object reappeared sinking lightly down out of the cloud although still at a vast distance from the earth bellerophon caught the child in his arms and shrank back with him so that they were both hidden among the thick shrubbery which grew all about the fountain not that he was afraid of any harm but he dreaded lest if pegasus caught a glimpse of them he would fly far away and alight in some inaccessible mountain top for it really was the winged horse after they had expected him so long he was coming to quench his thirst with the water of pyrene nearer and nearer came the aerial wander flying in great circles as you may have seen a dove when about to alight downward came pegasus in those wide sweeping circles which grew narrower and narrower still as he gradually approached the earth the nigher the view of him the more beautiful he was and the more marvellous the sweep of his silvery wings at last with so light a pressure as hardly to bend the grass about the fountain or imprint a hoof tramp in the sand of its margin he alighted and stooping his wild head began to drink he drew in the water with long and pleasant sighs and tranquil pauses of enjoyment and then another draught and another and another for nowhere in the world or up among the clouds did pegasus love any water as he loved this of pyrene and when his thirst was slaked he cropped a few of the honey blossoms of the clover delicately tasting them but not caring to make a hearty meal because the herbage just beneath the clouds on the lofty sides of mount helicon suited his palate better than this ordinary grass after thus drinking to his heart's content and in his dainty fashion condescending to take a little food the winged horse began to caper to and fro and dance as it were out of mere idleness and sport there never was a more playful creature made than this very pegasus so there he frisked in a way that it delights me to think about fluttering his great wings as lightly as ever did a linnet and running little races half on earth and half in air and which i know not whether to call a flight or a gallop when a creature is perfectly able to fly he sometimes chooses to run just for the pastime of the thing and so did pegasus although it cost him some little trouble to keep his hoofs so near the ground bellerophon meanwhile holding the child's hand peeped forth from the shrubbery and thought that never was a sight so beautiful as this nor ever a horse's eyes so wild and spirited as those of pegasus it seemed a sin to think of bridling him and riding on his back once or twice pegasus stopped and snuffed the air pricking up his ears tossing his head and turning it on all sides as if he partly suspected some mischief or another seeing nothing however and hearing no sound he soon began his antics again at length not that he was weary but only idle and luxurious 
pegasus folded his wings and lay down on the soft green turf but being too full of aerial life to remain quiet for many moments together he soon rolled over on his back with his four slender legs in the air it was beautiful to see him this one solitary creature whose mate had never been created but who needed no companion and living a great many hundred years was as happy as the centuries were long the more he did such things as mortal horses are accustomed to do the less earthly and the more wonderful he seemed bellerophon and the child almost held their breath partly from a delightful awe but still more because they dreaded lest the slightest stir or murmur should send him up with the speed of an arrow flight into the farthest blue of the sky finally when he had had enough of rolling over and over pegasus turned himself about and indolently like any other horse put out his forelegs in order to rise from the ground and bellerophon who had guessed that he would do so darted suddenly from the thicket and leapt astride of his back yes there he sat on the back of the winged horse but what a bound did pegasus make when for the first time he felt the weight of a mortal man upon his loins a bound indeed before he had time to draw a breath bellerophon found himself five hundred feet aloft and still shooting upward while the winged horse snorted and trembled with terror and anger upward he went up 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 until he plunged into the cold misty bosom of a cloud at which only a little while before bellerophon had been gazing and fancying it as a very pleasant spot then again out of the heart of the cloud pegasus shot down like a thunderbolt as if he meant to dash both himself and his rider headlong against a rock then he went through about a thousand of the wildest caprioles that had ever been performed either by a bird or a horse i cannot tell you half that he did he skimmed straight forward and sideways and backward he reared himself erect with his forelegs on a wreath of mist and his hind legs on nothing at all he flung out his heels behind and put down his head between his legs with his wings pointing right upward at about two miles height above the earth he turned a somerset so that bellerophon's heels were where his head should have been and he seemed to look down into the sky instead of up he twisted his head about and looking bellerophon in the face with fire flashing from his eyes made a terrible attempt to bite him he fluttered his pinion so wildly that one of his silvery feathers was shaken out and floating earthward was picked up by the child who kept it as long as he lived in memory of pegasus and bellerophon but the latter who as you may judge was as good a horseman as ever galloped had been watching his opportunity and at last clapped the golden bit of the enchanted bridle between the winged steed's jaws no sooner was this done than pegasus became as manageable as if he had taken food all his life out of bellerophon's hand to speak what i really feel it was almost a sadness to see so wild a creature grow suddenly so tame and pegasus seemed to feel it so likewise he looked round to bellerophon with the tears in his beautiful eyes instead of the fire that so recently flashed from them but when bellerophon patted his head and spoke a few authoritative yet kind and soothing words another look came into the eyes of pegasus for he was glad at heart after so many lonely centuries to have found a companion and a master thus it always is with winged horses and with all such wild and solitary creatures if you can catch and overcome them it is the surest way to win their love while pegasus had been doing his utmost to shake bellerophon off his back he had flown a very long distance and they had come within sight of a lofty mountain by the time the bit was in his mouth bellerophon had seen this mountain before and knew it to be helicon on the summit of which was the winged horse's abode thither after looking gently into his rider's face as if to ask leave pegasus now flew and alighting waited patiently until bellerophon should please to dismount the young man accordingly leapt from his steed's back but still held him fast by the bridle meeting his eyes however he was so affected by the gentleness of his aspect 
and by the thought of the free life which pegasus had heretofore lived that he could not bear to keep him a prisoner if he really desired his liberty obeying this general impulse he slipped the enchanted bridle off the head of pegasus and took the bit from his mouth leave me pegasus he said either leave me or love me in an instant the winged horse shot almost out of sight soaring straight upward from the summit of mount helicon being long after sunset it was now twilight on the mountain top and dusky evening over all the country round about but pegasus flew so high that he overtook the departed day and was bathed in the upper radiance of the sun ascending higher and higher he looked like a bright speck and at last could no longer be seen in the hollow waste of the sky and bellerophon was afraid that he should never behold him more but while he was lamenting his own folly the bright speck reappeared and drew nearer and nearer until it descended lower than the sunshine and behold pegasus had come back after this trial there was no more fear of the winged horses making his escape he and bellerophon were friends and put their loving faith in one another that night they lay down and slept together with bellerophon's arm about the neck of pegasus not as a caution but for kindness and they awoke at peep of day and bade one another good morning each in his own language in this manner bellerophon and the wondrous steed spent several days and grew better acquainted and fonder of each other all the time they went on long aerial journeys and sometimes ascended so high that the earth looked hardly bigger than the moon they visited distant countries and amazed the inhabitants who thought that the beautiful young man on the back of a winged horse must have come down out of the sky a thousand miles a day was no more than an easy space for the fleet pegasus to pass over bellerophon was delighted with this kind of life and would have liked nothing better than to live always in the same way aloft in the clear atmosphere for it was always sunny weather up there however cheerless and rainy it might be in the lower region but he could not forget the horrible chimera which he had promised king iobates to slay so at last when he had become well accustomed to feats of horsemanship in the air and could manage pegasus with the least motion of his hand and had taught him to obey his voice he determined to attempt the performance of this perilous adventure at daybreak therefore as soon as he unclosed his eyes he gently pinched the winged horse's ear in order to arouse him pegasus immediately started from the ground and pranced about a quarter of a mile aloft and made a grand sweep around the mountain top by way of showing that he was wide awake and ready for any kind of an excursion during the whole of this little flight he uttered a loud brisk and melodious neigh and finally came down at bellerophon's side as lightly as you ever saw a sparrow hop upon a twig well done dear pegasus well done my sky skimmer cried bellerophon fondly stroking the horse's neck and now my fleet and beautiful friend we must break our fast to-day we are going to fight the terrible chimera as soon as they had eaten their morning meal and drank some sparkling water from a spring called hippocrine pegasus held out his head of his own accord so that his master might put on the bridle then with a great many playful leaps and airy caperings he showed his impatience to be gone while bellerophon was girding on his sword and hanging his shield about his neck and preparing himself for battle when everything was ready the rider mounted and as was his custom when going a long distance ascended five miles perpendicularly so as the better to see whither he was directing his course he then turned the head of pegasus towards the east and set out for lycia in their flight they overtook an eagle and came so nigh him before he could get out of their way that bellerophon might easily have caught him by the leg hastening onward at this rate it was still early in the forenoon when they beheld the lofty mountains of lycia with their deep and shaggy valleys if bellerophon had been told truly it was one of those dismal valleys that the hideous chimera had taken up its abode being now so near their journey's end 
the winged horse gradually descended with his rider and they took advantage of some clouds that were floating over the mountain tops in order to conceal themselves hovering on the upper surface of a cloud and peeping over its edge bellerophon had a pretty distinct view of the mountainous part of lycia and could look into all its shadowy vales at once at first there appeared to be nothing remarkable it was a wild savage and rocky tract of high and precipitous hills in the more level part of the country there were the ruins of houses that had been burnt and here and there the carcasses of dead cattle strewn about the pastures where they had been feeding the chimera must have done this mischief thought bellerophon but where can the monster be as i have already said there was nothing remarkable to be detected at first sight in any of the valleys and dells that lay among the precipitous heights of the mountains nothing at all unless indeed it were three spires of black smoke which issued from what seemed to be the mouth of a cavern and clambered sullenly into the atmosphere before reaching the mountain top these three black smoke wreaths mingled themselves into one the cavern was almost directly beneath the winged horse and his rider at a distance of about a thousand feet the smoke as it crept heavily upward had an ugly sulphurous stifling scent which caused pegasus to snort and bellerophon to sneeze so disagreeable was it to the marvellous steed who was accustomed to breathe only the purest air that he waved his wings and shot half a mile out of the range of this offensive vapour but on looking behind him bellerophon saw something that induced him first to draw the bridle and then to turn pegasus about he made a sign which the winged horse understood and sunk slowly through the air until his hoofs were scarcely more than a man's height above the rocky bottom of the valley in front as far off as you could throw a stone was the cavern's mouth with the three smoke wreaths oozing out of it and what else did bellerophon behold there there seemed to be a heap of strange and terrible creatures curled up within the cavern their bodies lay so close together that bellerophon could not distinguish them apart but judging by their heads one of the creatures was a huge snake the second a fierce lion and the third an ugly goat the lion and the goat were asleep the snake was brought awake and kept staring around him with a great pair of fiery eyes but and this was the most wonderful part of the matter the three spires of smoke evidently issued from the nostrils of these three heads so strange was the spectacle that though bellerophon had been all along expecting it the truth did not immediately occur to him that here was the terrible three-headed chimera he had found out the chimera's cavern the snake the lion and the goat as he supposed them to be were not three separate creatures but one monster the wicked hateful thing slumbering as two-thirds of it were it still held in its abominable claws the remnant of an unfortunate lamb or possibly but i hate to think so it was a dear little boy which its three mouths had been gnawing before two of them fell asleep all at once bellerophon started as from a dream and knew it to be the chimera pegasus seemed to know it at the same instant and set forth a neigh that sounded like the call of a trumpet to battle at this sound the three heads reared themselves erect and belched out great flashes of flame before bellerophon had time to consider what to do next the monster flung itself out of the cavern and sprung straight towards him with its immense claws extended and its snaky tail twisting itself venomously behind if pegasus had not been as nimble as a bird both he and his rider would have been overthrown by the chimera's headlong rush and thus the battle had been ended before it was well begun but the winged horse was not to be caught so in the twinkling of an eye he was up aloft halfway to the clouds snorting with anger he shuddered too not with affright but with utter disgust at the loathsomeness of this poisonous thing with three heads like chimera on the other hand raised itself up so as to stand absolutely on the tip end of its tail with its talons pawing fiercely in the air and its three heads spluttering fire at pegasus and his rider my stars how it roared and hissed and bellowed 
bellerophon meanwhile was fitting his shield on his arm and drawing his sword now my beloved pegasus he whispered in the winged horse's ear thou must help me to slay this insufferable monster or else thou shalt fly back to thy solitary mountain peak without thy friend bellerophon for either the chimera dies or its three miles shall gnaw this head of mine which has slumbered upon thy neck pegasus whinnied and turned back his head rubbed his nose tenderly against his rider's cheek it was his way of telling him that though he had wings and was an immortal horse yet he would perish if it were possible for immortality to perish rather than leave bellerophon behind i thank you pegasus answered bellerophon now then let us make a dash at the monster uttering these words he shook the bridle and pegasus darted down a slant as swift as the flight of an arrow right towards the chimera's threefold head which all this time was poking itself as high as it could into the air as he came within arm's length bellerophon made a cut at the monster but was carried onward by his steed before he could see whether the blow had been successful pegasus continued his course but soon wheeled round at about the same distance from the chimera as before bellerophon then perceived that he had cut the goat's head of the monster almost off so that it dangled downward by the skin and seemed quite dead but to make amends the snake's head and the lion's head had taken all the fierceness of the dead one into themselves and spit flame and hissed and roared with a vast deal more fury than before never mind my brave pegasus cried bellerophon with another stroke like that we will stop either its hissing or its roaring and again he shook the bridle dashing a slantwise as before the winged horse made another arrow flight towards the chimera and bellerophon aimed another downward stroke at one of the two remaining heads as he shot by but this time neither he nor pegasus escaped so well as at first with one of its claws the chimera had given the young man a deep scratch on his shoulder and had slightly damaged the left wing of the flying steed with the other on his part bellerophon had mortally wounded the lion's head of the monster insomuch that it now hung downward with its fire almost extinguished and sending out gasps of thick black smoke the snake's head however which was the only one now left was twice as fierce and venomous as ever before it belched forth shoots of fire five hundred yards long and emitted hisses so loud so harsh and so ear-piercing that king iobates heard them fifty miles off and trembled till the throne shook under him well a day thought the poor king the chimera is certainly coming to devour me meanwhile pegasus had again paused in the air and neighed angrily while sparkles of a pure crystal flame darted out of his eyes how unlike the lord fire of the chimera the aerial steed spirit was all aroused and so was that of bellerophon dost thou bleed my immortal horse cried the young man caring less for his own hurt than for the anguish of this glorious creature that ought never to have tasted pain the execrable chimera shall pay for this mischief with his last head then he shook the bridle shouted loudly and guided pegasus not as slantwise as before but straight at the monster's hideous front so rapid was the onset that it seemed but a dazzle and a flash before bellerophon was at close grips with his enemy the chimera by this time after losing its second head had got into a red-hot passion of pain and rampant rage it so flounced about half on earth and partly in the air that it was impossible to say which element it rested upon it opened its snake jaws to such an abominable width that pegasus might almost i was going to say have flown right down its throat wings outspread rider and all at their approach it shot out a tremendous blast of its fiery breath and enveloped bellerophon and his steed in a perfect atmosphere of flame singeing the wings of pegasus scorching off one whole side of the young man's golden ringlets and making them both far hotter than was comfortable from head to foot but this was nothing to what followed 
when the airy rush of the winged horse had brought him within the distance of a hundred yards the chimera gave a spring and flung its huge awkward venomous and utterly detestable carcass right upon poor pegasus clung around him with might and mane and tied up its snaky tail into a knot up flew the aerial steed higher 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 above the mountain peaks above the clouds and almost out of sight of the solid earth but still the earth-born monster kept its hold and was borne upward along with the creature of light and air bellerophon meanwhile turning about found himself face to face with the ugly grimness of the chimera's visage and could only avoid being scorched to death or bitten right in twain by holding up his shield over the upper edge of the shield he looked sternly into the savage eyes of the monster but the chimera was so mad and wild with pain that it did not guard itself so well as might else have been the case perhaps after all the best way to fight a chimera is by getting as close to it as you can in its efforts to stick its horrible iron claws into its enemy the creature left its own breast quite exposed and perceiving this bellerophon thrust his sword up to the hilt into its cruel heart immediately the snaky tail untied its knot the monster let go its hold of pegasus and fell from that vast height downward while the fire within its bosom instead of being put out burned fiercer than ever and quickly began to consume the dead carcass thus it fell out of the sky all aflame and it being nightfall before it reached the earth was mistaken for a shooting star or a comet but at early sunrise some cottagers were going to their day's labor and saw to their astonishment that several acres of ground were strewn with black ashes in the middle of a field there was a heap of whitened bones a great deal higher than a haystack nothing else was ever seen of the dreadful chimera and when bellerophon had won the victory he bent forward and kissed pegasus while the tears stood in his eyes back now my beloved steed said he back to the fountain of pyrene pegasus skimmed through the air quicker than ever he did before and reached the fountain in a very short time and there he found the old man leaning on his staff and the country fellow watering his cow and the pretty maiden filling her pitcher i remember now quoth the old man i saw this winged horse once before when i was quite a lad but he was ten times handsomer in those days i own a cart horse worth three of him said the country fellow if this pony were mine the first thing i should do would be to clip his wings but the poor maiden said nothing for she had always the luck to be afraid at the wrong time so she ran away and let her pitcher tumble down and broke it where is the gentle child asked bellerophon who used to keep me company and never lost his faith and never was weary of gazing into the fountain here i am dear bellerophon said the child softly for the little boy had spent day after day on the margin of pyrene waiting for his friend to come back but when he perceived bellerophon descending through the clouds mounted on the winged horse he had shrunk back into the shrubbery he was a delicate and tender child and dreaded lest the old man and the country fellow should see his tears gushing from his eyes thou hast won the victory said he joyfully running to the knee of bellerophon who still sat on the back of pegasus i knew thou wouldst yes dear child replied bellerophon alighting from the winged horse but if thy faith had not helped me i should never have waited for pegasus and never have gone up above the clouds and never have conquered the terrible chimera thou my beloved little friend hast done it all and now let us give pegasus his liberty so he slipped off the enchanted bridle from the head of the marvellous steed be free for evermore my pegasus cried he with a shade of sadness in his tone be as free as thou art fleet but pegasus rested his head on bellerophon's shoulder and would not be persuaded to take flight well then said bellerophon caressing the airy horse thou shalt be with me as long as thou wilt 
and we will go together forthwith and tell king iobates that the chimera is destroyed then bellerophon embraced the gentle child and promised to come to him again and departed but in after years that child took higher flights upon the aerial steed than ever did bellerophon and achieved more honorable deeds than his friend's victory over the chimera for gentle and tender as he was he grew to be a mighty poet end of section twenty one recording by warren cotty gurney illinois section twenty two of a wonder book for girls and boys this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Section 22. After the Story of the Chimera. Eustace Bright told the legend of Bellerophon with as much fervor and animation as if he had really been taking a gallop on the winged horse. At the conclusion, he was gratified to discern by the glowing countenances of his auditors how greatly they had been interested all their eyes were dancing in their heads except those of primrose in her eyes there were positively tears for she was conscious of something in the legend which the rest of them were not yet old enough to feel child's story as it was the student had contrived to breathe through it the ardor the generous hope and the imaginative enterprise of youth i forgive you now primrose said he for all your ridicule of myself and my stories one tear pays for a great deal of laughter well mr bright answered primrose wiping her eyes and giving him another of her mischievous smiles it certainly does elevate your ideas to get your head above the clouds i advise you never to tell another story unless it be as at present from the top of a mountain or from the back of pegasus replied eustace laughing don't you think that i succeeded pretty well in catching that wonderful pony it was so like one of your madcap pranks cried primrose clapping her hands i think i see you now on his back two miles high and with your head downward it is well that you have not really an opportunity of trying your horsemanship on any wilder steed than our sober davy or old hundred for my part i wish i had pegasus here at this moment said the student i would mount him forthwith and gallop about the country within a circumference of a few miles making literary calls on my brother authors dr dewey would be within my reach at the foot of taconic in stockbridge yonder is mr james conspicuous to all the world on his mountain pile of history and romance longfellow i believe is not yet at the oxbow else the winged horse would neigh at the sight of him but here in lennox i should find our most truthful novelist who has made the scenery and life of berkshire all her own on the hither side of pittsfield sits herman melville shaping out the gigantic conception of his white whale while the gigantic shape of greylock looms upon him from his study window another bound of my flying steed would bring me to the door of holmes whom i mentioned last because pegasus would certainly unseat me the next minute and claim the poet as his rider have we not an author for our next neighbor asked primrose that silent man who lives in the old red house near tanglewood avenue and whom we sometimes meet with two children at his side in the woods or at the lake i think i have heard of his having written a poem or a romance or an arithmetic or a school history or some other kind of a book hush primrose hush exclaimed eustace in a thrilling whisper and putting his finger on his lip not a word about that man even on a hilltop if our babble were to reach his ears and happen not to please him he has but to fling a quire or two of paper into the stove and you primrose and i and periwinkle sweet fern squash blossom blue eye huckleberry clover cowslip plantain milkweed dandelion and buttercup yes and wise mr pringle with his unfavorable criticisms on my legends and poor mrs pringle too 
would all turn to smoke and go whisking up the funnel our neighbor in the red house is a harmless sort of person enough for aught i know as concerns the rest of the world but something whispers to me that he has a terrible power over ourselves extending to nothing short of annihilation and would tanglewood turn to smoke as well as we asked periwinkle quite appalled at the threatened destruction and what would become of ben and bruin tanglewood would remain replied the student looking just as it does now but occupied by an entirely different family and ben and bruin would still be alive and would make themselves very comfortable with the bones from the dinner table without ever thinking of the good times which they and we have had together what nonsense you are talking exclaimed primrose with idle chat of this kind the party had already begun to descend the hill and were now within the shadow of the woods primrose gathered some mountain laurel the leaf of which though of last year's growth was still as verdant and elastic as if the frost and thaw had not alternately tried their force upon its texture of these twigs of laurel she twined a wreath and took off the student's cap in order to place it on his brow nobody else is likely to crown you for your stories observed saucy primrose so take this from me do not be too sure answered eustace looking really like a youthful poet with the laurel among his glossy curls that i shall not win other wreaths by these wonderful and admirable stories i mean to spend all my leisure during the rest of the vacation and throughout the summer term at college in writing them out for the press mr j t fields with whom i became acquainted when he was in berkshire last summer and who is a poet as well as a publisher will see their uncommon merit at a glance he will get them illustrated i hope by billings and will bring them before the world under the very best of auspices through the eminent house of ticknor and company in about five months from this moment i make no doubt of being reckoned among the lights of the age poor boy said primrose half aside what a disappointment awaits him descending a little lower bruin began to bark and was answered by the graver bow-wow of the respectable ben they soon saw the good old dog keeping careful watch over dandelion sweet fern cowslip and squash blossom these little people quite recovered from their fatigue had set about gathering checkerberries and now came clambering to meet their playfellows thus reunited the whole party went down through luther butler's orchard and made the best of their way home to tanglewood end of section twenty two recording by warren cotty gurney illinois End of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne